Good morning. It is good to see everyone today out there in the virtual world. We want to thank you for joining us today uh, here at Northside. My name is Nick Skinner. I'm the senior minister here, and it is a pleasure to be able to welcome you as part of our service here today. We want to uh, just encourage everyone as we come around this time together to just take a moment. We're going to take a moment here, actually in a moment, to uh, just set our minds and our hearts before the Lord. And we've already begun doing that with the wonderful music that we've started out with today. Uh, Before we get into that, though, I just want to remind everybody, uh, for one, let us know you're here. We want to hear from you in the comment section and things and a great way to interact with you there. So we encourage that. Uh, Also, we want to encourage everyone, if you would, just, of course, be prepared when we get to later in our service. We'll have uh, our time of communion, and we want to encourage you to find whatever emblems you can uh, to represent uh, there in your home, to represent the body and blood of of our Christ. Uh, maybe it's a saltine cracker and apple juice. Maybe you got grape juice around. Uh, whatever it is, uh, you can find it's more about the meaning of, of him and what it represents as opposed to what we, we use uh, for doing so. And so I encourage you to get that ready to go, and that will be happening later in our service. But for now, as I said, we're going to just take a moment to set our hearts and minds before the Lord in prayer. And so we ask that you just join us together as we, uh, we begin this time with a word of prayer. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can meet here again, yet in this virtual space, uh, where we can continue to gather as the body of Christ to uh, sing songs of praise, to hear your word proclaimed, to remember the sacrifice of your son Jesus, uh, Lord, and uh, to just enjoy this fellowship, even if it's, again, a little different than what we are used to. Lord, we thank you so much for this opportunity. We thank you for your grace we thank you for uh, your, your love. Uh, we thank you, Father, that we uh, have uh, the potential or the, the opportunity to embrace eternity in Jesus. And, Father, that gives us so much to sing for, the hope that we have in him. And so, Father, we come before you right now. We take everything that we have experienced today, uh, thus far, everything from this week, Lord. We just want to just take a moment, just to take a breath, set it before you. Lift it to you in this moment. Father, asking for your wisdom, asking for your guidance, uh, that you would illuminate the path for us. And Father, again, just simply uh, refresh us with your presence today. We love you, Father, and we give you the praise and the glory in the name of Jesus. Amen.
reading today from 1 Peter. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In all of this you greatly rejoice, though now, for a little while, you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by the fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Amen.
Good morning, Northside. I miss interacting with other people. I miss handshakes, hugs, and being able to connect with someone. I miss this with my friends, with my coworkers, and with fellow Christians. As Christians, this is a big deal to us. Nick reminded us of this this weekend when he talked about confession as a core of the Christian faith last Sunday. We confess our sins to God and that restores us. But in order to confess to others and receive that confirmation that we're forgiven, we have to be around others. We may not be able to be around other Christians right now other than our family members, but we can use our communion time to reflect on the fact that we're all part of one body, the body of Christ. Today we'll ask for forgiveness but I would encourage you when you're doing that to think about the fact that as Christians, we're all in this together. You may be at home in your living room in your pajamas with a corn chip for a communion wafer, but your brothers and sisters at Northside and across the whole world are doing the same thing, in many cases at the same time as you. In Romans, Paul says that we who are many form one body. Paul goes on to say in 1 Corinthians that as the body of Christ, we should have equal concern for each other. In one part, if one part suffers, every part suffers with it. In Ephesians chapter 4, Paul says that as the body, we should build each other up in love. So as you take communion today, whether you're alone or with family, remember your church family, and that even though this may be the toughest time of our lives, that we're all in this together. Let's pray. God, thank you for bringing us all together. Um, even if we're all not in one place, Lord, help us to... Uh, remember that we are part of your body, the body of Christ. And Lord, we ask that you forgive our sins. In your name we pray. Amen.
Good morning again, Northside family. It is uh, good to be with you and uh, good to be able to share in this time of worship together uh, as we again, again, gather together. I appreciate Rob's words. Uh, I really do appreciate the reminder that because of what Christ did for us, we are all one in him. And so that is a really good reminder for us uh, today, even uh, when we are apart, uh, we are together. And that has always been the case in Christ. I want to just I want to encourage uh, everyone today. Uh, it's amazing how each week we see new examples of the body of Christ and generosity, uh, be it in you know, the generosity through time. I see so many, uh, some of you have sent cards in the mail and things, and I know there's a lot of that kind of thing going on uh, in our congregation as far as trying to encourage one another. Uh, being generous with our time, being generous with our resources, picking up that phone, giving someone a phone call, uh, and uh, and just sort of encouraging one another in those ways. And I want to just encourage us to continue to be generous with what we have been given. That's why God has entrusted what he has to us. All that we have, uh, he gives us. It's sort of what we have is kind of on loan (laughs) from him. And uh, so many examples of people being good steward of their time and resources in the midst of this. I want to continue to encourage that. I also want to encourage everyone to, if you haven't, uh, to uh, continue to be generous toward the ministry here uh, and the things that we are, we are doing to try to continue to speak and be light to our community in this time. Uh, you can go to our church website, nschristianchurch.org, and click on the donate tab there to uh, give a financial gift, one-time gift, or a recurring gift. You can also send a contribution to our uh, P.O. box. We encourage that you send it to the P.O. box, not the physical address. The P.O. box is P.O. box 1344, Georgetown, Kentucky, 40324. And if you would do that, we would be uh, very grateful and honored and uh, do our best to be good stewards of those resources uh, as well uh, in, in how we use, use those for the Lord's kingdom. I want to start today in this message uh, by sharing with you uh, Haddon Robinson's definition of a committee. Here's what Haddon Robinson calls a committee. A group of the unfit appointed by the unwilling to do the unnecessary. (laughs) That's his definition. And for a lot of us, that is the way we often view the potential benefit, if we can call it that, the potential benefit of making decisions in a group setting. And it's sort of discouraging maybe to think of it in those terms, but, but the truth is we have a lot of experience that causes us oftentimes to view uh, you know, getting together in a decision-making body in, in that way. We've all been in meetings that go nowhere. We've all been in meetings and conversations that were hijacked from their main objective by somebody's pet issue. We've all been in gatherings where people are participating out of obligation instead of a sincere desire for the task at hand or uh, the, the issue that's trying to be resolved. And so we've all been a part of these experiences where we see people getting together for a decision-making process to, to, as we say, get wisdom from the Lord and make an informed decision, and we see it go south. And so it's no wonder that a lot of times when someone talks about a committee at church or they talk about getting together uh, to, uh, in a group to make a decision, that we oftentimes see ourselves echoing the same thoughts as Haddon Robinson, a group of the unfit appointed by the unwilling to do the unnecessary. Tim Woodruff shares the following about his experience in church business meetings on his website, timwoodruff.com. Here's what he says. I've endured meetings that would never end, meetings that squandered on matters that didn't really matter, meetings that meandered from one topic to another without any apparent method to the madness, meetings that were short on prayer and long on hand-wringing, meetings that suffered from the worst excesses of groupthink and poor assumptions and bad information, meetings that ended in the whimper of inconclusiveness, meetings that left everyone in the room frustrated, agitated, and irritated. And he follows that by saying this, why? Why is the question that haunts me? You might expect church meetings would function like nuclear fission, Pack enough high-spirit, high-energy disciples into the same room and something explosive should happen. Instead, sad experience teaches us that when many of us come together, we're more likely to sputter than reach critical mass. So we understand 
we've had these common experiences, and, and sometimes when it comes to getting together as the body of Christ particularly, we, we, we're skeptical about what God does in those moments. But yet we have this, at the same time, pesky little teaching, this pesky little instruction from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, where Paul tells us that we actually need each other, that we need each other, including the wisdom that we can provide to each other as we're all pursuing Christ together. Paul calls us one body with many members, and Rob indicated that a little bit earlier also in his meditation. So we have this teaching that we're supposed to be together, that God desires good things to happen when we're together. He has an intention for that, and we need to desire that, and, and there's good to come from it when we do. So how do we balance the reality plus the teaching of what God gives us? Doug Larson states this, Wisdom is the reward that you get for a lifetime of listening when you would have preferred to talk. <laughs> Something's missing. Something's missing here. If God intends for helpful wisdom to come from our brothers and sisters and from the time that we spend together, that those are moments where God and sometimes comes and, and he'll speak to us and give us that guidance. If that's not what we're experiencing, then there must be something about ourselves and about our approach that must be off. I would ask us to think of this question today. What if there is a whole host of wisdom out there that God is waiting to give to us Wisdom that he, he knows we need to hear. And we're simply not hearing it because we don't understand how to hear it in a gathering of others. How to prepare ourselves to hear it in a gathering of others or even to be the conduit ourselves. What if there's a whole host of wisdom out there we're missing because we don't know how to hear God's wisdom in other people or be the ones through whom he speaks? Let's turn to Acts chapter 15 this morning to find the answer to that question as we take a look at some things that the early disciples were encountering as well. Acts chapter 15, beginning in verse 1. It says there, Luke writes, But some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers that unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders about the question. Verse 4. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they, all, they declared all that God had done with them. But some believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees rose up and said, It is necessary to circumcise them in order, in order them to keep the law of Moses. Now, one of the things we need to keep in mind here when we're reading this passage is this. We need to keep in mind that this is the early time of the early church. And so a lot of these folks are still kind of getting used to the idea of, okay, what about my separate life as a, a, a strict follower of, of Judaism? Uh, what about that does, needs to stay in my past? And what of that is now a, a part of my Christian faith? A lot of them, the early believers, came from the Jewish faith. And so they were used to a life where they identified as part of the Pharisee tradition or part of the Sadducee tradition and things. And so they're, they're in this moment of trying to learn and understand what part of that stays behind and what part of that is now part of this gospel of grace. And that's why you have believers who still kind of classify themselves at this time as, as Pharisees or being from that tradition. So they're in this type of, type of flux. The apostles and the elders were gathered together to consider this matter. And after there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, Brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you, that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their hearts by faith. Now therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing on a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear. But we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. And all the assembly fell silent, and they listened to Barnabas and Paul as they related what signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. After they finished speaking, James replied, Brothers, listen to me. Simeon has related how God first visited the Gentiles to take from them a people for his name. And with this, the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written. 
After this, I will return, and I will rebuild the tent of David that has fallen. I will rebuild its ruins, and I will restore it, that the remnant of mankind may seek the Lord, and all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who makes these things known from of old. Therefore, my judgment is that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God. In verse 22. So then it seemed good to the apostles and the elders with the whole church to choose men from among them and send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. A lot to unpack here. Let's talk about what, what it means to the topic we're talking about here today and how God shows up and imparts his wisdom to us when we're together as believers. The two or three are gathered. There's a few significant pieces of this passage. First of all, I want us to notice this, that this decision that we see the church making or being encountered with in in Acts chapter 15 is the most significant and potentially divisive issue that the newly unified church had seen to that point. Of course, as Paul or Peter indicated, uh, he was referring back to the time in, in Acts chapter 10 when he was uh, with the household of Cornelius and the Lord had led him to basically accept that Gentile believer uh, into uh, the church as one as an equal to himself uh, with all the gifts and the abilities of, of the inheritance of eternal life and those things. And so he's taking them back to that moment and, uh, and that moment when God begins to really open the door to Gentiles into his church. And that's the newly unified church that we're talking about. And this, 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 this issue that's come up because of the, you know, the, the, Jewish, uh, the Jewish believers of the past, you know, they, they're thinking about all the things that they used to do and how they used to observe the law of Moses. And again, they're trying to wrestle with what they're to, to leave behind and what still comes with them and what is this gospel of grace. They're wrestling with all these things. And so there's this temptation from them to come in and say, no, you have to be circumcised the way that we used to observe in the Old Testament. And the Gentiles, being not from the Jewish tradition, that wasn't part of their experience. And so uh, this is a new thing to them. And it's a potentially divisive issue because Acts chapter 10, all indications are God accepts the Gentiles as they are without having to be circumcised. And so here you have this really important issue that comes up. And it's significant because this is a pivotal moment to determine what the gospel is really about for for all of church history. Now, God has already determined it. But now is the opportunity for the leaders of the early church to kind of say, okay, and affirm, this is, what, this is what God is about. This is what his gospel is about. It's either a gospel of grace or a gospel of performance. That which is it going to be? And this, this decision that's being entertained here at this time is going to set the course for all the nearly 2,000 years to the time of the present where we are today about how we define what God's grace is and how we define what the gift of salvation is and how we even attain the gift of salvation. Uh, Peter's making the case here. He's saying, are we saying that what God said was okay? After I saw the Holy Spirit inhabit these folks and I saw God pour out his approval on them in Acts 10, uh, are we saying that what God said was okay is now not enough? Is that what we're saying? If the early church began mandating that all, cir- all believers had to be circumcised, the gospel of grace is dead. Because then it becomes all about performance and outward transformation and not about a reliance simply that what Jesus did at the cross is enough. Earlier this week, Elizabeth and I were at our dinner table and we were, this was after the kids had gone to bed. And we were, we were talking, there are two of us believers, <laughs> talking about, we were reminiscing a little bit about uh, college and, and things and people that we knew in Bible college. And one of the things we were talking about was, you know, there are a lot of people we know from Bible college and those days when we were in school that are still in ministry or they're still serving in the calling that they, you know, felt back then. But there are also a number in, uh, that we knew in Bible college who uh, sent, in the years since then, now it's been about 16 years or so, uh, in the years since then have not just maybe fallen away from their calling, but they've fallen away from the faith completely. And we were talking about, you know, how can that be? And maybe that's a question we all would have. And, uh, you know, how can that be? So the same, the same thing as someone being raised in the church, right? How, how can, and then they, they walk away from it. How can that be? And one of the great things that God, I think, really helped me along with that in that conversation, as we were talking together, in that moment together, God brought about some wisdom to me, that really spoke to me, and, and it came down to, it's not really about 
whether people sincerely believe the gospel, it's what gospel do they sincerely believe. You know, I believe that people, most people, when they go off to Bible college or when they enter the church, enter into a new life in Christ, they have a sincere desire to, to practice and believe the gospel as they understand it. But the question is, what gospel is it that they're trying to understand? What is the gospel to them in that moment? What is the gospel to them? Is it a gospel of grace or is it a gospel of performance? If, the, if it's the gospel that realizes there's nothing we can do to earn our salvation and that Christ did all of that and he took care of it for it, then, then there's the gospel of grace. That's, that's great. Or is it a gospel that they believe that's built simply on doing the right thing, acting the right way, having all the outward display of what people expect a righteous person to look like? Exhibiting the behaviors that everyone expects of you. And then, not only because you believe that for yourself, then you're trying to live that way, but then you're also trying to, you're placing that on other people. And what inevitably happens is people will disappoint that expectation as you also will disappoint that expectation in yourself because it's not possible. And so, if, if, the, if the gospel they follow or buy into is one based on performance, they fall away disillusioned. Is it the gospel of grace or the gospel of performance, the difference makes, is everything. And this is the decision that is before the council we see in Acts chapter 15. This is what hangs in the balance for the church. Will we continue to follow the gospel of grace and preach the gospel of grace? Or will we preach a gospel of performance? Notice also in this passage that debate happened. Debate happened. Good, well-intentioned people who love God were all in the same room. And, and not only did debate happen and discussion, but it wasn't a quick decision. I think sometimes we think of the apostles in very like ro rose-colored glasses. And we think that it, almost like we would imagine them walking into the room and saying, we know the will of God with certainty. And so this is his will. And like, it was like a five-minute meeting because they were all so holy and righteous in themselves that, that they were able to know these things. That's not true. Uh, that's not the reality of where they were. They're still fallible human beings, and, and they're trying to understand the will of an, an infinite God as finite beings, imperfect beings. And when you have that sort of circumstance uh, of us trying to get our heads around the will of a, an infinite God uh, in the limitations that we have, you're going to have discussion and debate because we only see part of the picture together. It's when we come together that hopefully God then uses that to help us see a clearer sense of the larger picture. So go easy on people. <laughs> go easy on people. We're each trying to understand the wise course of action within the limitations of our finite human ability and imperfection. I think the question for us is, sometimes we get bothered by the presence of debate. I want us to know that the presence of debate does not mean that, uh, that the will of God or the Spirit of God is absent. It doesn't, that just having the presence of debate doesn't mean that by default. The question we need to be asking is, what is it that kept that debate from being unproductive? What is it that made that debate that they had and the discussion they had, what made it go the, the productive route as opposed to the destructive route? And I believe it's this. And this is the thing I hope we can grab onto today. They listened for God. They listened for God. Their arguments, their discussion did not stem on pure opinion. Notice how this conversation unfolds. Uh, you know, Luke gives us the important highlights of this discussion that we need to know. Peter stands up and he says, listen, all, what I know is my experience from you know, however long ago, and for us it would be Acts chapter 10, but they didn't know it as Acts chapter 10. And he says, all I know is my experience. When God told me to go to Cornelius, he poured out his spirit on them. He blessed them. He called them in as part of his children. And, and there was no restriction ever placed on, well, I can't give you the Holy Spirit until you're circumcised. He accepted them then. And so he recounts his, his experience. And James goes back to Scripture. He goes back to the Old Testament prophet Amos and, and he talks there. He go, takes the, the people back to the 
uh, prophet Amos, where Amos affirmed God's desire to rebuild his household from all the nations of the earth in the Old Testament. In addition to this, there's Barnabas and Paul, okay? They've come to town to bring this issue to them, to seek the guidance. And so they sit back and they listen to Barnabas and Paul, who, uh, you know, these are the guys that are out in the field. They're out with these new Gentile, predominantly Gentile churches in different locations like Antioch and things. And they're seeing God work in these Gentiles. And they hear the stories that Barnabas and, and, and uh, Paul bring uh, talking about how they've seen God bless and, and, and work through these Gentile believers and accept them and affirm them and their presence in the kingdom. And, and all of it without them being circumcised. So by taking the time to listen for God, the Spirit was able to guide them in making a pivotal decision which preserved the precious gospel of grace that we enjoy ourselves today and which we are honored to be able to share with the rest of the world. Notice that the decision wasn't reached by totalitarian leadership. It wasn't like one person walked in the room and said, this is it. This is what we're going to believe. This is what we're going to teach. You all get in line. It, that wasn't the way it was reached. It also wasn't reached by anarchy. It wasn't reached by uh, total upheaval or revolution. It wasn't that kind of situation. It wasn't even reached by democracy, actually. Uh, there, there wasn't, it wasn't reached by a, a vote of majority rule where the apostles are sitting around and 51% means we go ahead and, and sorry, the rest of you, you know, you're left in the dust. No, what they did, as Richard Foster states, they dared to live on the basis of spirit rule. No 51% votes, no compromises, but spirit-directed unity. That's a scary thing. We, we like those other constructs because they give us control. To be at spirit-directed rule, that's a challenge because it means we have to release control to God. But that's what they did, and so must we. We must dare to live together under the Spirit's guidance. That's the challenge today. Dare to live together under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. How do we ensure that our times together, whether it be worship or one-on-one -on -one conversations with other believers, like Elizabeth and I had at the dinner table the other night, or in a Sunday school class setting, or in a group setting, in youth group, how, how do we ensure that our time together, when we're together, reflects living together under the guidance of the Holy Spirit? How, how do we make our group meetings, our times together, like what we saw in Acts chapter 15? I think there are some helpful things we can take away from this today that really mean a lot to us and will. The first one is this. Prepare yourself spiritually to guide and be guided. Prepare yourself spiritually to guide and be guided. Each one of us is responsible to make sure that we are spiritually prepared for the things we participate in and, and, and our role in the body of Christ. Each time we're together even in a format like this one. God has a purpose for your presence. God has a purpose for your presence right now, being with us in this moment watching this video. God has a purpose for your presence, and not only does he have a purpose for your presence, but oftentimes the purpose he has is not what it will benefit you, but how he will work through you to the benefit of somebody else. It's what he wants to do through you for others. Do you prepare yourself spiritually for that moment? When you read through Acts and the days of the early church, you discover that prayer, fasting, and worship were a part of their common experience. It was a part of life. It was a way of life for them. They, they practiced these things consistently as an individual and as a community. I think when we often show up to worship, we expect to meet God there. But I think a lot of times for us, and, and I've been guilty of this as well, we don't start to think about God maybe until we hit the door. And then we're sort of trying to, to, to warm up a cold engine. But I, I wonder how many of us really start before that. Do we prepare ourselves for the time of worship through prayer? Do we prepare ourselves for our gatherings together before we even get there. 
Do we get in that spiritual space where God can talk before we turn on the Facebook feed, before we uh, open up the Zoom meeting? Have we already been with him and asking him not only to speak to us and everyone else in the group, but offering ourselves as a willing vessel for him to do so through? Greg Pruitt in his book, Extreme Prayer, says that when we believe God can move in our congregations in a truly amazing way, we begin to understand that prayer is the work of leadership. Prayer is our work. Through prayer, we change our church and we touch our world. Pruitt wrote, I began to learn not to pray about my strategies, but to make prayer the strategy. So prepare yourself spiritually to guide and be guided. Number two, humble yourself to seek godly counsel. Humble yourself to seek godly counsel. We gotta, it's about, you know, do we start in a place where we're ready to receive what God wants and, and then do what God wants? And part of that is, uh, are we approaching that with humility? According to Richard Foster, St. Francis of Assisi was in great agony of doubt about whether he should devote himself to prayer and meditation, which was common in that time. Of course, he was in the, t- it was the time where monasticism's big, you know, uh, monks are seen very pious and that sort of life. So he's in this great debate about whether or not he should devote himself only to prayer and meditation or whether he should engage in preaching missions, an evangelistic type calling. So wisely, St. Francis sought out counsel. He sent messages to two of his most trusted friends, one by the name of Sister Claire and the other one by the name of Brother Sylvester. And he asked them to meet with another one of his friends who was serving as a messenger who would relay the message back to him. And so these three were to get together, and they did so very quickly, immediately. They gathered to pray, and both Sister Claire and Brother Sylvester returned with the same answer. When the messenger returned uh, to give the message to St. Francis about what they had had come together on as far as the Lord's will, St. Francis first washed his feet and prepared a meal. And then kneeling down before the messenger, St. Francis asked him, what does my Lord Jesus Christ order me to do? The messenger replied that Christ had revealed that he wants you to go about the world preaching Because God did not call you for yourself alone, but also for the salvation of others. Number three, know the proper limits. Know the proper limits. There are four cautions that Richard Foster also gives us that we must be aware of when it comes to relying on other members of the body of Christ to impart wisdom and and to rely on them to be part of God's guidance to us. There are four cautions we need to keep in mind, and here they are. Number one, beware of manipulation. Beware of manipulation. Uh, even though we are a part of the body of Christ, that we are one in Christ, uh, it also, there's, a, there's still brokenness present in each one of us, which means we can at times, uh, our, our less than desirable characteristics can take over at times, even if we don't intend to. And it, it's something that we can be susceptible to. Corporate guidance, guidance when we're seeking the guidance from others outside of ourselves must always be handled within the larger context of an all-pervasive grace. Grace must be present in the person who's giving us guidance and in the place where we are seeking guidance. Grace must be present. Because if grace isn't present, present, this is what ends up happening. That advice degenerates into an effective way simply to straighten out deviant behavior. It simply becomes a way to control people to do the thing that you want them to do. A way to an authorized system, as Foster says, through which all differing opinions are simply brought into line. And when it gets about getting everybody in line and grace isn't present there, I mean, that, that's a dangerous thing. So beware of manipulation. Number two, also beware of hard heartedness. There's danger in going the opposite direction of manipulation. And that is it's possible for a hard hearted and stiff necked people to hinder spirit inspired leaders. While leaders need the counsel and discernment of the believing community, I mean, we, we, we as leaders in the church, we, we need the community to kind of give us that feedback. And we need to be, of course, the shepherding side of things where we're hearing what's going on in, in life and for people in our, our congregation. That's very important. But leaders also need the freedom to lead. When we put a person in leadership, we're saying God has called this person to lead. We feel like this person has been called to to take on this role. And if we feel that way, that God has, has, has called them to that, and we're saying really that we trust them. We trust uh, them with leadership. That means that they shouldn't have to bring every detail of life to the community. Uh, there has to be a freedom to lead as well. And so God appoints authoritative leadership in his church so that his work may be done 
uh, upon the earth. It's the church, the leadership and decision making of the church should not always filter through the most hard hearted, stubborn person because that is destructive to the church body. And so that, that gives them too much control uh, in many ways. And we need to give leaders the freedom to lead. Number three, maintain consistency with Scripture. Maintain consistency with Scripture. When seeking God's wisdom and guidance from others or as a group, even as an individual, this one thing remains true. And take, on, take hold of this here. The Spirit will never lead in opposition to the written word that He Himself inspired. The Spirit will never lead in opposition to the written word that He Himself inspired. As a matter of fact, as Foster points out, Scripture itself is a form of corporate guidance. It's a way that God speaks through the experience of the people of God. When we read through Scripture, we're reading the experiences of other people as they try to follow God. And so it's, it's a, a, a type of corporate guidance that guides us. Lastly, recognize human limitations. Recognize human limitations. We're fallible human beings, and there are times when despite our best efforts, our own prejudices and fears keep us at times from a spirit-led unity. Sometimes we simply see things differently, even when we have, again, the best of intentions. A few ch- verses later, in chapter 15, from where we were just a minute ago, in verse 39, you'll read something else about Barnabas and Paul, about how they had a little bit of a, a disagreement. And it happens. Relationships change. Groups change. Change happens. How do we handle it? It's important that in the event that that human fallibility prevents our spirit-led unity, that we handle it with grace. Be kind to each other. If a relationship needs to change, do it gracefully, praying for each other and asking for God's blessing on the other person. Let's dare to live together under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. It is something daring. It is something that demands our faith. But it also is one of the most life-giving experiences we can embrace. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this time together today. Lord, we thank you for the guidance of your Spirit. It's sometimes scary, Lord. Like I said, we like to have the constructs that gives us sort of some feeling of control. But in some ways, Lord, those things can be a hindrance to us. Because when we feel like we're in control, it it gives us this sense also where we feel like we have to rely less on the Holy Spirit. And so at times we begin, begin to lean on these things like a crutch. And in so doing, it keeps us from the experience of, of, knowing what it is to fully trust God, to fully trust you and your spirit to guide us and direct us and lead us in all things. Father, we want to be a people that when we come together, either in a one-on-one as believers or larger than that, we want to be a people who are prepared to hear what you have to say to us through not only your word, but through each other. Father, we want to be a people prepared to hear your word. We want to be a people prepared to act. We want to be a people prepared to be your vessel to someone else. And it only happens with humility, a rich prayer life, a rich walk with you. And Lord, the faith to follow, the faith to to step out into spirit-led leadership. Lord, we love you. And we give you the praise and the glory in Jesus' name. Amen.
again, it's been wonderful to be together with you today and sharing this time together. If today there was something that motivated you in what you heard, sang, experienced, that motivated you to want to draw closer to Jesus or get to know him, we want to invite you uh, to pursue that, uh, that thought and that decision, and we would love to be with you on that journey. Uh, if you would, uh, send us a private message or send us an email. Send us a private message on the Facebook page there uh, or send us an email to office at nschristianchurch.org and we would love to follow up with you to see how we can come alongside you and help you in that journey to knowing Jesus and uh, giving your life to him. We want to, uh, that's what we're here for. We're here to help people know this great saving grace. So we extend that invitation to you. We want to encourage you in that. Uh, today, also, I just want to encourage our church family to be lifting up the family of uh, Ir- Ir- Fam- Irvin Bullock and his family today. Uh, Irvin's father passed away this morning, and so uh, we want to encourage you to just be lifting up Irvin and Kim and their family today as uh, they are uh, wrestling with that loss. So continue to lift them up in prayer. Also, we again, we know that we uh, the uh, uh, the. The date that the governor set for resuming worship services is out there. We just want to let you know no decision has been made yet on a date for which we will do that. Uh, Our leaders are continuing to prayerfully uh, consider and discuss that topic. As a matter of fact, we're having another uh, uh, Microsoft Teams meeting, a remote meeting with our leadership later today. Well, we'll be discussing that even further. Uh, So just stay tuned. Uh, We'll let you know as soon as we have uh, information to pass along for that. But until that time comes. We'll continue to meet here for worship on Facebook Live and even beyond that time. Facebook Live is going to be a part of our ministry or online streaming. And so we want to encourage you to continue to join us. If you can't be uh, in person when that resumes, we encourage you to join us here uh, online as well. With that, I'm going to go ahead and let Wayne close us with a word of prayer. And then following that, uh, we'll be dismissed. Have a great day. Father, we thank you for this time today, time to be in your presence with those of like precious faith. And Father, we thank you that you have given us a mind and you have given us each other, that as we work together, each one of us brings a certain wisdom into the conversation into the conversation and we thank you for that but may our hearts be most open to your Holy Spirit as it guides and directs we pray these things in the precious name of Jesus Amen